Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to our brown bag program today. Um, we're very pleased to have Pastor Drake Williams um, speaking. Um, Pastor Drake is uh, Minister of Theology and Mission at Central Schwenkfelder Church. Um, grew up there um, and has was baptized, ordained, sent as a missionary, and has been a pastor of the church for 13 years. Um, he has served as a missionary in a wide range of countries and is still serving at, I can't pronounce it, but in, in um, Holland at the ETF. ETF. Okay. And he's the author of numerous books and articles, and we're glad to have him speaking on George Weiss today. Our program, Brown Bag Program in October, is going to be um, by Bob Wood on mills in the area. And I want to mention that our November program is by Dave Woods, the uh, Director Emeritus here. It will be Zoom only. He will be joining us from his travels, I think, in Arizona. So he will have the November brown bag, uh, and you can come here or simply sign up for Zoom for that one. So thank you, and Pastor Drake. Well, good to see everybody. Hope you're enjoying your lunch, too. Uh, Pleasure to be here uh, with the Brown Bag Lunch, and thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, today's topic uh, for conversation is uh, Reverend George Weiss, uh, Prayer and Pietism. Oh, technical difficulty. There we go. That's great. Thank you. Getting chopped off. That's not good. So mm -hmm. thank you, Beth. Yes, so we're talking about Reverend George Weiss, uh, also uh, his comments on prayer. And then we're going to compare it with uh, some uh, some studies on pietism and then uh, draw a few uh, conclusions uh, from uh, this. So. Move the slide. There we go. There we go. We can move the slide. OK, good. Yep, we got to go. Uh, this is uh, a series of uh, brown bag lunches that I've um, presented on uh, Reverend George Weiss. Uh, it goes back to uh, 2020, so I continue to uh, pursue this uh, fascinating uh, Schwenkfelder uh, leader. Uh, first started looking at uh, uh, George Weiss, his life, his catechism, and the Eucharist, then probed it further by looking at uh, his life, his catechism, and uh, his view on uh, the person of Jesus Christ. And if you know Schmeichfelder so uh, well enough, uh, Confessors of the Glory of Christ, that's an important uh, uh, title for Schmeichfelders, and hence to explore Weiss and also uh, his understanding of Christ, I thought was important too. So then, put them all together for the, the third one, George Weiss, his view of Christ as expressed in the Eucharist. Okay. Well, we've gone enough on that route, so let's uh, see if we can uh, work further on George Weiss and pursue his viewpoint on prayer. Who was Reverend George Weiss? I'm just curious in a room like this, how many of you have heard of Reverend George Weiss before? Okay. All right. I figure many, many of you have. Uh, I'm not expecting if you've been to these brown bag lunches previously that you remember who he is. I'm not uh, going to take an extensive time to uh, lay out uh, who he was because I want to get to his thoughts on prayer and his comparison uh, with um, uh, some of Spainer's uh, thoughts on prayer. But George Weiss, uh, first pastor of the Schwenkfelders in the colonies in the 1730s. He is a writer. He has written a catechism, which, thank you to Hunt Schenkel, has provided us with the catechism today. Here it is. In, should we say, in the flesh? No, we shouldn't say that. Uh, in paper form. So if you wish to take a look at it uh, later, it's up here. He's a significant interpreter of Schwenkfeld's uh, view on uh, the Eucharist, as well as on other matters, too. And today we're looking at what ways did he uh, pass along teaching about prayer? What was he speaking about? What was he 
passing along to those uh, in the colonies, as well as those who were on the exile from Silesia through Saxony uh, and eventually on to the colonies. About George Weiss, Alan Anders Seip had this to say about George Weiss. It may safely be said that there has never been a more intensely spiritual Schwenkfelder than George Weiss. Oh, that plays into our thoughts uh, uh, very greatly today. Uh, prayer and certainly spirituality closely connected. And then also someone who is uh, intensely uh, attuned to the understanding of Caspar Schwenkfeld. So we have a later um, uh, person than Schwenkfeld, uh, Schwenkfeld passing in 1561. Now we have somebody in the 1700s who is uh, bringing forward Schwenkfelder thought, but also bringing forward Schwenkfelder pietism. So uh, George Weiss is an important person for us to look at on Schwenkfelder prayer in general. Who is George Weiss? His upbringing and his education? He's someone who was born in Harpersdorf in Lower Silesia in 1687. He was uh, someone who came from a relatively poor family, plain and poor, but uh, steeped in Schwenkfelder thought and Schwenkfelder uh, affairs. His father was Caspar Weiss, and Caspar uh, uh, was someone who had an extensive library, and uh, the young George uh, made his way through his father's library. And consequently, he became very well read and informed in doctrine and Christian theology, as well as in the writings of Caspar Schwenkfeld. Aside from the writings of Schwenkfeld, he understood various confessions. Uh, he taught himself languages, uh, learned to be able to read in a variety of different languages, um, and uh, that being uh, beside German, not English then, but uh, German, uh, he's someone who is able to go back and forth through many different um, uh, languages, and it enriched his uh, theological understanding. In his secular education, he became proficient in ancient languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. I hope you can all tell what language that is. That is Greek. That's very good. That's very good. And he used these to his advantage in scriptural exegesis and in giving language instruction. He was someone who was writing from a very young age. Uh, by the time that he reached age 13, he had uh, been doing copying and he had copied over uh, pastilles. Uh, some of you, uh, how many of you are familiar with postille? Okay, a few of you, okay, if you're not, uh, it's, it's a series of sermons uh, uh, that uh, would be written down and uh, George Weiss uh, copied the ones that he felt uh, were, were meaningful and started doing that at age 13. I don't think I would have had such an interest at age 13, uh, but uh, George Weiss um, uh, did. And uh, we should expect that he is someone who is uh, developing his theological understanding from that point in time. His writing skills went on to influence uh, others. If you've been here to the library, you'll remember just downstairs, there he is, Christopher Schultz uh, seated. Um, uh, here with a picture of the St. Andrew behind him, but Schultz would go on to write a catechism. Who influenced uh, Schultz? It was uh, George Weiss. Then uh, Weiss was also someone who translated, uh, transcribed, I should say, the uh, Schwenkfelder hymn book, and he uh, did this with the help of his father. 874 hymns. Uh, some of you are singers. I'm trying to remember how many hymns we have right now in the central Schwenkfelder hymn book. I'm guessing we're about two to 300. Some of you who use that book regularly, it's about right, 300? Uh, higher, okay, all right. Okay, it didn't have, doesn't have 800 hymns, so, though. Uh, 874 hymns, so this is larger than a modern day uh, hymn book. And also uh, we ought to consider uh, many, many uh, verses in these old German hymns. So yes, he did a lot of transcribing. Transcribing of sermons, transcribing of hymns, and hymns, of course, can add, aid to one's uh, understanding of uh, theology and scripture, but uh, can also aid to uh, the understanding of the inner life and how other people understood the inner life. So this is uh, who we're reading as we move on to uh, some of his thoughts about prayer. He had a significant role in the migration as Schwenkfelders moved from uh, Lower Silesia uh, through to Saxony and then on to Pennsylvania. 
He learned to expound scripture at the point, this point of his uh, time of uh, travels and discuss difficult matters uh, with the uh, Schweinfelders at that time. He also uh, was teaching children. So children were coming to him, others who wanted counsel were coming to him. And then this uh, led to the formation of his catechism, uh, his uh, written thoughts uh, about the scriptures that he would like to pass on to others. They would eventually become uh, uh, compiled uh, later on when he reached uh, America. He migrates in 1734. Um, some of you who are familiar with uh, the Day of Remembrance, which is, by the way, is coming up. And it's coming up at our church to be celebrated this year. You are welcome. If you'd like to join us on uh, Sunday, uh, the 22nd, please uh, consider yourself invited. The day that the Schwenkfelders, uh, though, land at uh, Penn's Landing in Philadelphia, his wife uh, passes away. He buries her, and then he leads uh, the very first Deckmastock service. After uh, landing in America, he is uh, elected as the Forstair, in other words, uh, the, um, the main uh, leader of the Schwenkfelders, uh, and he is elected so by the nine, nine uh, house uh, theater, the, the uh, house fathers, where the Schwenkfelders were, were meeting in different homes at that time, but they looked to George Weiss. And he is also in charge of uh, conventical instruction as well as religious instruction of children. Would go on to influence uh, Balthasar Hoffman as well as Christopher Schultz and would travel around with Balthasar Hoffman as uh, he visited uh, the Schwenkfelder homes with these uh, various services and also with the uh, Council of Others. He is uh, now, his remains are in uh, the Salford Meeting House uh, Cemetery, and uh, this is just a picture right outside of the Meeting House where his gravestone is. So that's uh, George Weiss. Um, in a nutshell, there's much more that could be said about Weiss, but I want to move on to his reflections now about uh, prayer as it's found in the Catechism. So as we move on to the Catechism, let's see if we can provide an overview of its contents. And I should say at this point, uh, thank you to um, Dr. Alan Bimar, who's overseeing a project with me uh, as we're working with about six uh, or so other transcribers of this catechism. We have transcribed about 64% of it, I think, right now. And we are beginning translation of this uh, for eventual uh, publication. What's found in the Weiss Catechism? It's pr produced uh, by George Weiss, uh, as I said, began in Saxony in 1733 and continued on as he developed his uh, thoughts uh, further in the new world. Its contents include, as he says, uh, the entire orthodox and thorough doctrine concerning God's counsel and will for the salvation of mankind through Christ and the Holy Spirit, according to the content of Holy Scripture. So it's a rather comprehensive uh, understanding of the faith, at least as uh, Vice I saw it in uh, the 1730s, 1740s. What's the title page? Well, there you go. It's on the left if you want to read uh, German script from the 1700s. Be my guest. If you want the translation, here it is. Christian Catechism. Questions on certain main points of Christian teaching and faith for the use and exercise of Christian youth, and for instruction and service of Christian parents and house fathers, so that their children receive and are guided by this exercise and learning. They themselves practice it and seek in such a way to make Christian theology known to them, ordered and composed by George Weiss, and then the copy date. It's got a number of sections to it, and it breaks down uh, like this. There were 261 uh, questions about uh, creation. Some of them, I would assume that you get uh, uh, very easy, like uh, uh, who created everything, or on the first day, what was created. But then he will probe uh, more uh, deeply about uh, various things. So some of it is uh, obvious uh, what you could take from a simple reading of Genesis. Others are more developed. Then 278 questions on prayer. 261 on creation, but 278. He had a lot to say about this. Then another 259 questions on the Lord's Prayer. 
So just thinking sequentially here is the creation. And then what's the next thing that uh, Vice gets to? Uh, prayer. And then the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. That's the order of books is important here. And this is uh, one of the first things that he speaks about. Then he goes on to talk about the law and the Ten Commandments, 136 questions. The church, 131 questions. The confession of Christ, as is found in Matthew 16, 64 questions. Then 166 questions about baptism. 271 questions on the Lord's Supper, uh, which is a topic for another time, uh, but 271 questions about the Lord's Supper, which uh, the Schwankfelders were not celebrating corporately at that time as it was the Stillstock. That's perhaps for another time. Then 88 questions uh, on marriage. Some of you I know are interested in theology, but some of you are mathematically inclined. So out of some uh, five, out of the, these uh, 1,600 or so questions, we have 578 questions and answers about prayer. That's a lot. 578, 32% of this catechism, one third of this catechism is about prayer. So what do you say? Uh, more than what I can say in, in this uh, amount of time. I'm going to now try and uh, work with the 12 points that he makes about prayer in uh, this catechism. I wish I had more that I could tell you about uh, the entirety of it transliterated and transcribed. Um, it's about 60% uh, or so transliterated. Um, so there are just going to be some gaps um, uh, on my understanding, but uh, we do have the 12 points, which I think you'll find interesting. As he introduces this uh, section on prayer, he says this, 12 necessary points of prayer. The Christian sentences are very useful and necessary to know, believe, reckon with, and then he doubles down and says, believe again. So we've got 12 points uh, about prayer that he's going to specifically speak about. And not only are they, they to be informed, but uh, he wants everybody to uh, grasp them, and know them, reckon with them, think through, and then practice them which fits uh, the Schwankfelders and the uh, experiential uh, knowledge of uh, the person of Christ very well. Now, of these 238 questions uh, that we have on uh, just prayer in general, we've got 12 points that emerge. And under each of these 12 points, we will have eight to 34 sub-questions. I'm not going to share with you the eight to 34 sub-questions that uh, but know that he just doesn't state it and move on. He states it and then tries to explain it, sometimes for eight questions, sometimes up to 34 questions. I think the average is about, uh, about 20, 22 for each point. Point number one, one should prepare oneself beforehand for prayer. One should prepare oneself beforehand for prayer. That's his first point that he speaks about, and he has eight or so questions uh, following uh, afterwards. What does he mean by this? Um, he means that one ought to be uh, reckoned with the fact that one is speaking to the Heavenly Father, the one who has created all things, uh, that this is not uh, uh, one activity of many throughout the day, uh, whether it be gardening whether it be preparing the meal, uh, whether it be uh, going out uh, for a walk or visiting a friend. One ought to prepare oneself so that one recognizes speaking to the creator of, of the universe uh, with this. And he takes eight questions to develop that further. Point number two, prayer is a wonderful, wonderfully useful, necessary, and very pleasing work uh, to God. This is interesting as well. Uh, wonderful, wonderfully uh, doubling up uh, on that. Uh, he's uh, expressing the um, uh, appreciation, the um, 
struggling for words here. You say wonderful, wonderfully. I don't think I use those words uh, frequently, but uh, doubling up like that. Uh, uh, this is something of great uh, interest and blessing and benefit to the person as well as also uh, to uh, the God who asks for such prayer. It is useful, but it is also necessary. It's not useful and optional. Uh, it is useful and a necessary uh, practice uh, for um, uh, for the Christian. And for that matter, it's not only for the Christian, but it is a very pleasing work to God, too, who truly appreciates the Christian who comes in prayer regularly before him. I think he has some 12 questions explaining that. Point three. We should know with certainty that God has promised certain hearing to those who pray to him. What does he mean by that? As the Christian prays to God, we should know that he hears us. We should know that he hears and answers according to his will. That he is not just uh, someone uh, who is a distant, who is not interested, but somebody who truly hears, truly knows, and truly wishes to answer. And it is with certainty that Weiss expresses this and explains this for some 20 or so questions. Point four of 12. A true prayer, which is to be valid before God, must be made in and through the name of Christ. A true prayer, which is to be valid before God, must be made in and through the name of Christ, not in some other uh, God's name, not in just one's own um, uh, wishes and whims or wills, but it has to go through the name of the person of Christ so that prayer is hinged or uh, uh, hooked into the understanding of Christ, uh, which was very important for the Schweinfelders too. For the prayer to be valid, it has to go through the name of Christ. And of course, you've heard uh, uh, pastors, ministers uh, close their prayers uh, in Jesus' name or in Christ's name, all so that the prayer goes uh, at least verbally through the name of Christ uh, to the Father. Point five, we should know thoroughly the things for which we should ask and in what and in what manner we should ask for them. At this point, the uh, section on Gebet, uh, the section on prayer gets uh, rather lengthy in vice. We should know thoroughly the things for which we should ask, uh, not necessarily for anything willy-nilly uh, uh, there, but those things that would be uh, according to God's will, those things that would be for ultimate blessing, uh, those things that would be uh, truly on God's heart and our heart. And we should also know in what manner we should ask for them. And repeatedly what comes up in these sub-questions here is asking in humility, knowing to whom we're talking to, not to... Uh, 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 just uh, one of the guys or one of the girls, but we're talking to the creator of heaven and earth who truly has the ability to act and to answer. So the word humility comes up frequently in the sub-questions. Point six, right prayer in true living faith is part of it. Okay, it'll take some 20 or plus questions, maybe 30 questions, I think, at this point in time. Uh, right prayer in true living. Um, uh, prayer and active living, faithful living go hand in hand, uh, which fits for uh, the Radical Reformation, which fits for uh, Pietism too uh, at that time. Uh, the, the Christian is to follow the Lord, and then the Christian is to pray uh, as one follows the Lord, praying through the name of Jesus. Uh, it's not as if one does one thing on the side uh, and then uh, has the prayer life in the other. No, they go hand in hand. They are merged in Weiss's thought. Point seven, right prayer requires us to understand that God should not be prayed to in time, place, or place, but in spirit and truth. Here I can hear the, the, the radical reformation, the emphasis of Schwenkfeld, what's happening in the heart coming through here. Uh, we pray in the heart and spirit and in truth. Um, uh, place and time is less uh, helpful, um, not as if he's uh, uh, against these things, but it's about uh, praying in the heart, in spirit and in truth. Some of you who recognize the Gospel of John uh, uh, might recognize that the, the true worshipers will worship Jesus uh, in a place of spirit and in truth. John's ideas come through here. Point eight, 
A heart that is humble, detached, and devoted to God belongs to a true Christian prayer. A heart that is humble, detached, and devoted to God uh, belongs to a true Christian prayer. Humble, we've already uh, uh, thought of that uh, idea previously. Detached, uh, uh, detached from the affections of the world and attached instead to affections uh, that are heavenly. De uh, detached from the world, yet devoted and attached uh, to, uh, uh, to the Lord. Point nine, constant perseverance and single-minded adherence to prayer is required for true prayer. Constant perseverance. Uh, it's not a one and done, but it's a consistency. Um, reflecting the relationship that we have uh, with the Lord uh, that is uh, constant over time. Uh, so we bring the prayer requests, uh, not necessarily once, although sometimes uh, the prayer is answered uh, uh, one time, but may, uh, may take several times, uh, may take several months, may take several years. Uh, it's all part of um, uh, the prayer life that uh, George Weiss is encouraging. Constant perseverance and single-minded adherence, not to uh, swerve to the right or to the left. I know I'm with uh, some people who pray uh, frequently, at least here in this room, and my guess is some of you have had uh, prayers on your prayer list uh, for years. Uh, George Weiss would be happy with that. Uh, it gives me a little bit of courage, too. Some prayer requests are on my list and are still on that list for many years. Point 10, that a right prayer requires a right, pure, true understanding of the words used in prayer. <clears throat> um, an understanding of um, what it is that we are saying. Um, one apps, uh, I haven't gotten to this point of uh, transliterating or translating this point. But one, th one thing that does uh, show up interestingly from the catechism is there aren't uh, written prayers that uh, vice encourages Christians to pray other than the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is, uh, is there, but uh, there's not a prayer that he uh, lists out to uh, pray this on the 1st of January, the beginning of the year, or pray this on the Day of Remembrance, even though, of course, he thought the Day of Remembrance was very uh, important. He, he doesn't list those prayers. Um, um, he's interested in uh, true heart's words and true heart's affection to the, to the Lord rather than the uh, repetition of, of prayers, which also fits um, in line with pietism, as we'll see in a moment. Point 11, what is important to realize when praying is that it should not only be addressed to God the Father, but also to his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I haven't gotten to the sub-questions here, but it almost seems like a repeat here of uh, the importance of Jesus being involved in, in the prayer, not praying through another God, but praying through the person of Jesus Christ. And point 12, finally, when praying, it's important to remember that one should not just pray, but also wait for and perceive the gracious hearing and sweet answer of the Lord. I have not gotten to the transliteration and translation of these, but uh, of these sub questions, uh, but it is a, a point where uh, Weiss does talk about waiting. Uh, everything else has been about uh, approaching and what to say and what demeanor. Now at uh, point 12, uh, it's about waiting and waiting on the Lord. Okay, so that's a summary of the 12 points, as best as I can give them to you, on September the 11th, uh, 2024. Let's now go on and compare this uh, with uh, pietism and looking at um, Philip Jakob Spainer. How many of you have heard of Spainer before? Only a couple. Okay. All right. Let's talk about pietism. How many of you have heard about pietism before? Okay. Brief summation of pietism. It's a, a Christian theological tradition emphasizing the need for heartfelt Christian faith. What happens in the heart is more Im important than what is on the exterior. It emerges from German Lutherism, Lutheranism in the late 17th century in Germany. So uh, for those of you interested in Schwenkfeld, it's after the time of Caspar Schwenkfeld. Yet it is before the time of George Weiss. 
pietism resulted from Christians being upset with the division and wars that were taking place at the time. Uh, they uh, tried to de-emphasize uh, some of the attention to uh, teaching and doctrine, and instead uh, wanted to bring uh, unity, and they wanted to bring peace, and they were interested in practical expression of the Christian faith. Pietism uh, emerged from German Lutheranism, so it's coming out of the Reformed uh, tradition, the broadly Reformed tradition. This uh, tradition at that time was very interested in small group studies. Those of you who are Schwankfelders might recognize conventicles, so, okay, it fits in line with that. It also has increased uh, lay involvement in a variety of ministry activities. Uh, pietism interested in the laity. Individual devotional lives uh, were very focused on Bible study and prayer. Um, this is all coming from the pietistic movement in the late 17th century. The importance of right living, doing the right thing, demonstrating action and works, uh, not words alone, but also uh, works, and demonstrating a heartfelt faith. What comes from the passions? What comes from uh, the inner heart? Um, uh, the new birth should definitely have taken place uh, through conversion, but then that new birth needs to be worked out um, for that conversion to be seen as being valid. So here's one of the main pietists, uh, Philip Jakob Spener. When did he live? 1635 to 1705. So he predates Weiss, but he is after Schwenkfeld. He is considered later uh, the father of pietism. He's written two works, uh, Pia Desideria, uh, uh, written in 1675, and then in German, Allgemeine uh, Gottes Gelehrheit, uh, written in 1680. So he's a, a German, uh, and he is writing from the heart's expression. Uh, Pia Desideria is uh, about uh, uh, the importance, the passions of the heart. Pia Desideria, meaning heart's dev devotion, written in 1675. It is still a foundational uh, document uh, for uh, pietism today. Our own Peter Erb has uh, uh, interacted with this uh, in his book on uh, pietist writings, and I thought that you might be interested in this quote uh, about Spainer and about prayer, and I've underlined a few words uh, in uh, this quote. It's gonna go on for about three slides, so bear with me. One should therefore emphasize that the divine means of the word and sacrament are concerned with the inner man. Hence, it's not enough that we hear the word with our outward ear, but we must let it penetrate to our heart so that we may hear it, the Holy Spirit speak there, that is, with vibrant emotion and comfort, feel the sealing of the Spirit and the power of the Word. I've noticed at this point I've uh, focused on the inner man and penetrating the heart. You would think, okay, that's enough. We keep going. Nor is it enough to be baptized, but the inner man, where we have put on Christ in baptism, must also keep Christ on and bear witness to him in our outward life. Nor is it enough to have received the Lord's Supper externally, but the inner man must truly be fed with that blessed food. All right, it's enough. Spanner, we got it four times already. No, he keeps going. Yeah. Nor is it enough to pray outwardly with our mouth, but true prayer and the best prayer occurs in the inner man. And it either breaks forth in words or remains in the soul. Yet God will find it hit upon it. Nor again is it enough to worship God in an external temple, but the inner man worships God best in his own temple, whether or not he is in, in an external temple at the time. So one could go on. <laughs> All right. Prayer in the inner person, in the inner person, in the inner person is what's, uh, what uh, Spainer is speaking about, which fits quite well in line with uh, what we've uh, looked, about, uh, looked at in uh, George Weiss now, too. Interestingly, Spainer has some points on prayer. He's got three foundations for prayer, which he bases then about 10 points on. So we'll read them and then we'll compare them. Here's Spainer on the foundations for prayer. 
Because prayer is to be worship, and because it is uh, because in it one is dealing with the highest, it is required that one bring service before him which is pleasing to him. Sounds rather similar to uh, to Vice talking about uh, uh, the right life leading to the right prayer. Sort of fits in line here with Spanner, doesn't it? Although Spanner predates Vice. Point two is a foundation. Prayer always occurs before those to whom the basis of our hearts is open. Prayer is not only heard by those to whom we speak with our mouths, but also to those whom we open our hearts. Makes sense from what we just read in Pia de Sirada, that uh, it's about what happens in the inner person, the inner man. Uh, here, Spanner speaking once again. What's most important is not uh, what's happening from people listening to our prayer, but what's taking place in the inner person. Three, in prayer, one must take care how one pleases God because prayer is a means to attain all our needs. It's a very strong statement uh, for uh, one to make, one who has uh, great uh, interest in the Christian faith and proper devotion. Prayer is the place that meets or attains all our needs, according to Spanner. That's very, very strong and perhaps maybe makes sense of uh, some of the thoughts that uh, Weiss had as well. Now, how is prayer to be carried out from God, from uh, this uh, document, God-pleasing prayer that um, uh, Peter Irvis included in his book, Pipes, of Selected Writings? He writes, prayer must take place from a penitent heart or a repentant heart, not a heart uh, that is uh, going the own way or doing one's own thing. Prayer must also occur in faith, point two. Prayer must occur with great humility and a heart inclined to reverence toward God. Point four, prayer must occur with reflection. Prayer must occur with zeal and true desire, not with just one's own desire, but with true godly desire. Prayer must occur with fitting modesty and discretion. It's not something to be showy. It's something rather uh, to uh, be taken uh, and, and done with, uh, in modesty. Prayer must occur in a fitting order. Prayer must occur out of a heartfelt love for one's neighbor. Here, uh, connecting the um, right practice with, uh, also with, uh, right practice to neighbor with uh, the right practice in prayer. Point nine, prayer must be continual and unceasing. And then 10, lastly, we must give it in thanksgiving. Now, from this document uh, on God-pleasing prayer, uh, there are no sub-questions uh, in uh, uh, Herb's, uh, tr uh, trans I believe it's his translation. If not, it's at least um, uh, the reproduction of this uh, document in um, uh, Pietist Selected Writings. There's no more explanation than what I can give you right here. Uh, what I've given you is what, what is there uh, in the book. But my sense is, are, you probably can see there's a, quite a great correspondence here between Spainer and also with Weiss. So comparing, many, many similarities. Of course, both are German, both from a similar time period. Uh, prayer is an essential act of Christian expression and is to be taken very, very seriously. Both gave specific points for prayer. Uh, they didn't let uh, their followers just uh, think uh, they can go in whatever way they want. They wanted to direct uh, their followers in ways to pray. And then prayer is to be from the heart uh, rather than from the recitation of, um, of, of written prayers. Although they're not necessarily against written prayers, uh, their focus is in other places on uh, the practice of the heart. Let me try and bring this uh, in for conclusion before we have a time of discussion. Schwenkfelders were taught by George Weiss about proper prayer life and were not left to consider it out on their own. He could have left placed other things in his catechism, but instead he took uh, one third of the catechism to speak about prayer. It was important for Weiss and he wanted his followers to know how their prayer life uh, could be fulfilling and could be pleasing uh, to the Lord and pleasing to themselves. I already said it's about one third. It's not an afterthought. Great exist agreement exists between the prayer considerations of Spainer and Weiss. In Weiss's mind, this would connect Schwenkfeld's understanding with Spainer too. Remember how um, uh, Sipes said that it was uh, uh, Weiss who was a great uh, 
explanatory, uh, someone who explained Schwenkfeld, but also uh, explained uh, piety. Um, if that's the case, then we have a Schwenkfelder thought uh, coming into, into Weiss, but it also seems as if we have pietistic uh, thought too, and this uh, Weiss becomes a, a meeting place for all this. Schwenkfeld's understanding of prayer then somehow uh, becomes uh, merged with that of Spainer too. While Spainer dies in Germany in 1705, his influence has been said to extend to the colonies. In fact, in some uh, dictionary articles that I read, it's, it, it's primarily, they say, oh, German pietism influenced Germany and inf influenced places in Europe, and then eventually made its way uh, to the colonies. I'd like to say maybe it made it to the colonies a little sooner than some of these, uh, at least dictionary writers uh, said, because it, I, in my mind, it comes through in Weiss's uh, points on prayer that seem to uh, fit very well in line with Spainer. A thought that can be further developed is the degree that Spainer's influence extended through Weiss and the Schwenkfelders uh, into Pennsylvania, I think more so than what I've seen so far uh, in the reading of Donna. Now, a couple of practical conclusion, conclusions here today for some uh, contemporary society. Uh, this, we're in a time where uh, spirituality uh, is present, uh, atheism is uh, growing uh, and increasing, and some um, uh, may not have much uh, uh, instruction about uh, prayer at all, at least from a Christian perspective. Uh, in the very least, uh, Spainer and Vice uh, saw prayer as being important, but ought to be practiced in Jesus' name. Uh, they would not have uh, uh, gone uh, astray from that. Uh, if following in line with uh, Spainer, Vice, uh, Schwenkfeld, the importance of praying in Jesus' name is emphasized. And then devotion to prayer with perseverance, not just a one and done, but perseverance, and then expectation as well as waiting, are aspects that are less common uh, in modern talk about prayer. Um, sometimes we'll hear of a tragedy, uh, our prayers go out to them. And I appreciate uh, the, uh, the politeness and the sincerity of that. Uh, but if we're going to follow in uh, at least the ideas of Spanner uh, and Vice uh, and others, it's the perseverance as well as the expectation and waiting that are elements that can be added into uh, a prayer in modern times that unfortunately I don't think we hear talked about um, uh, substantially enough. Well, I've got a bibliography attached to these uh, slides, a select bibliography if you're interested, but um, I'll call it quits there. And if you have some comments, some questions, uh, some thoughts, I look forward to this as I'm uh, working to develop this further myself. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, uh, the question for those online is, uh, um, can you fill me in more, I assume on uh, Spainer and Vice on the Holy Spirit and prayer? Uh, okay, uh, from, well, yeah, I, just, I could take it in a variety of ways, so maybe I'll start down the road and maybe you can correct me or adjust me along the way. I mean, the Holy Spirit's the, the, the third person of the Trinity, so um, uh, Spain or advice, I mean, they would certainly be in agreement uh, uh, with that. Uh, um, he resides uh, with the, the Christian, with the believer. He's uh, one who uh, it helps uh, the Christian pray. Um, from this presentation today, I didn't emphasize it at all because he wasn't in any of the points from, from Spainer or Weiss, although I feel certain that some of the sub-questions would have explained the role of the Holy Spirit, and I, I, I'm just not prepared to tell you to tell you further today. Is that what you would? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. This question is a little personally. Um, you've done so much work in research spent place. Um, why are you looking at this? And his work. Okay. Um, the question for those online, I've, I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, work on Vice, so why am I drawn to him? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, why 
people would cross the Atlantic on a very small boat, put, putting their lives in jeopardy, leaving uh, their uh, lives be behind in Germany. Uh, why would they, uh, in, uh, in South Asia, why would they do that? Um, and here we have, a, you know, we have a witness here as to some of the things that were being talked about uh, during that uh, migration and uh, on, on that ship and then early uh, in uh, colonial life. Um, there's, there's a vibrancy in, in this that I think can speak to our age, which seems to be uh, lethargic and slothful in so many ways. Um, uh, Weiss was a, a leader in the Schwenkfelders uh, at the time, and uh, we have Schultz's translation. We don't have Weiss's uh, uh, translation uh, circulating. Um, uh, surely this would be a, a help and an, an encouragement for the denomination. A couple of reasons. Yep, thank you for asking. Great. Yes. Are all kinds of questions and answers? Or is that typical? It's typical for the question uh, for those on Zoom. Are, are catechisms in a question and answer form? Yeah, that's that's typical. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them, some of the questions are, are basic uh, knowledge recitation, and others are, are, are more probing. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. It's interesting that uh, we should be talking about catechism. Uh, when I think back to my childhood, I was being raised as a term Catholic by my mother, yeah. and Catechism of Bowling was arrogant in the training of the child, questioning the task, and it was the child's responsibility of the parents' help to memorize the text for confirmation. And it was at the juncture uh, of one question in particular that my mother said, I can't take it anymore. I'm finished. I'm done. I'm going to become you. <laughs> <laughs> and which is not the case in the Roman Church in the But the question my father was reading, the question was well, the kind of things that would happen to my father's soul uh, since he lived outside of the Catholic Church and it would be burned in eternity mm -hmm. and hell forever. So that was interesting. This is something happening. <laughs> uh, for those online, uh, uh, comment being made about the Baltimore Catechism and uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and may, uh, perhaps maybe I don't know if one of the questions got were they exhaustive? Was there disagreement? I I, I don't know. There was no Okay. Well, some of these uh, catechism questions can go on uh, for a very uh, can be very lengthy. Others uh, uh, more short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. This is only select bibliography. Yeah. Um, um, was, if I remember many years ago, reading, was it twice involved in some controversy that certain churches of the Middle East were referred to people because he was not? Uh, that we train or the university train? Uh, okay, the question for those online, um, was Vice involved with controversy because he was not biblically trained or theologically trained? Uh, I, I can't answer that for that question uh, further. He, he, he was only in, uh, in the colonies for a few years before, before he died, so... There was an opposition to him, and certain. Uh, could very well be. I'm just not fresh on that today. Yep. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. That's that's a good a uh, good question. Uh, for those online, um, uh, did uh, Vice have an int uh, interest in silent prayer or audible prayer? Um, in my uh, transliteration tran translation of uh, these sub questions, uh, I I haven't seen uh, an opposition one against the other. Um, uh, 
uh, he, he was he's for both, uh, but he's not preferring one over the other. He is encouraging the Christian to prepare properly uh, for prayer and the activity of prayer. And that's as far as I can take it right now. Thank you. Well, I hope this is helpful. Are there questions online? There are no questions online. Okay. All right. No questions online. If there aren't any other questions here, we'll call it a day. All right. Thank you, everyone.